first first and foremost i apologize for my slight delay i was caught up in a very urgent work uh, however uh, the topic that we are going to be having right now is uh, is a very important aspect of patient safety but let us first look at what we are seeing here right uh, i'm going to give a small paint a small scenario for you and uh, let's see from from where we can take you there scenario first on the 3rd of may at 5:45 am nikita manchanda was 30 year old gives birth to a baby boy after cesarean section are we rolling are we good uh, can i change the slide separately all right so on the 3rd of may nikita manchanda who is 30 years old gives birth to a baby boy and on the 4th of may at about 10 pm or so uh, she complains of abdominal pain and and back pain the nurse then subsequently rings up the doctor who then prescribes a painkiller right the uh, the medicine is then administered i repeat that the doctor has spoken to the phone over the phone to the nurse and uh, that's how the drugs are given now on the 4th of may again at 11 pm uh, there has been no improvement in nakita's condition the nurse again calls up doctor who again prescribes some more painkillers now what happens is on the 5th of may uh, her condition deteriorates further uh, and then finally the nurse informs dr pooja who is on night duty dr pooja comes but leaves after a cursory checkup on the 5th of may again this is at 6 pm in the oh sorry 6 am in the morning after fair amount of uh, pain uh, throughout the night nikita starts to vomit dr pooja arrives but isn't able to diagnose the problem nikita's condition worsens her blood pressure dips on the 5th of may at 7:45 am the senior, the senior doctor comes and finally checks on nikita and advises that nikita be shifted to the icu On the 5th of May at 30 a.m., Nikita finally shifted to ICU, but she stings, sings, uh, sings, starts gasping, her pupils start dilating, and she stops responding. Uh, the skin goes cold, and she finally collapses. And at 9:30 a.m., she is put on ventilator. At 10 a.m., she is declared dead. Right now, this is the broad scenario. Who do you think was at fault? This, this had a lot of wide publicity in the newspapers and other media, print media. Uh, but who do you think was at fault? We can discuss probably uh, at the end of all the slides, since I'm sure you can sit and listen to that from there. Now, thereafter, Nikita's family filed a complaint of medical negligence. The family members are also alleged that hospital didn't have a blood bank, and that uh, the, the 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 patient's family was asked to go to another hospital, which is about 10 kilometers from there, to get blood for the patient, and also that uh, the 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 ninth floor building had only two lifts, one of which was stopping only at selected floors. There were multiple problems that they were complaining about. Now. the average waiting time for the lift is 10 to 15 minutes is what they were saying and uh, nikita plus also that nikita was on the fourth floor whereas the newborn baby was on the second floor and um, feeding was difficult and became more and more painful as as the pain progressed now that is one scenario uh, do you think it is medical negligence think about it this is another huge news that came in the indian media about uh, seven babies who died in a span of one and a half days in a hospital in malda right which is a city in in west bengal uh, which is a state in india there is another uh, place in uh, one of our states in the country uh, where uh, the where the uh, death happened right so uh, i hope i can i can hear but i don't know if you can hear me at all so this is another incident many such uh, deaths have been reported that happened there now this is a second scenario this is the voice of a man who uh, who has who who's who's telling us a story of his father 
in his bed. He was saying his, this is what he said, he was saying he was trying to rise, but his muscles were so weak that he couldn't sit up anymore. I was only 13 at that time. He had been, he has been in the hospital for two years, but still kept on losing weight. The, di the doctors could not find the correct diagnosis. He weighed nine, 195 pounds when he was admitted, and today he's only 70 pounds. He was extensively checked for all kinds of cancers and referred to psychiatric counseling. His business had suffered huge losses, and he went home expecting to die. She says that his mom started to uh, read stuff on her own, and that she finally found about gluten absorption. I, hope, I think you must be knowing gluten uh, absorption problem, for example, cabbage and things like that are, have, have gluten in them. And later was made the diagnosis of celiac disease. But the question that he repeatedly asks the healthcare workers is as to how could two years of testing overlook what my mom could find in a, in a, in a span of a few months? That is the question that he wants us to answer. My father has permanent neurological deficit second to severe malnutrition. And uh, why wasn't parental uh, nutrition maintained? He says that his family is now financially insolvent. What, what was all the money we paid used for? Very, very important question. Questions that can be asked by and to all of us. The question that I want to ask you is, are these instances of medical negligence or are they uh, a, a problem which is a, which is a larger error in the system? That is the question. A very important uh, point which I want to make here is this, is not who caused the accident, but what caused the accident is what is relevant. And I quote Lucien Leap, a famous um, physician who's worked in the field of patient safety, where he says that medical errors most often result from a complex interplay of multiple factors. Only rarely are they due to the carelessness or misconduct of a single individual. Very important, very relevant. Now let us move towards what is our, I'm going to be dealing with one aspect of patient safety. Patient safety is something we all have heard, so I didn't want to give a, uh, an all-encompassing um, lecture on patient safety. I wanted to take up a specific topic of patient safety and speak about it. What is patient safety? Patient safety is a freedom from unintended harm due to healthcare intervention. It's a, patient safety is actually a healthcare discipline that emphasizes the reporting, analysis and prevention of medical errors that often lead to adverse health events. And what are these uh, commonest errors that are held which are the <coughs> Improper transfusions, you have wrong side falls, uh, medication errors, uh, restraint related problems, burns, misdiagnosis, problematic identities. These are the commonest um, errors that happen. And what are the commonest areas? Obviously, the places of the hospital that are, that are most crowded, the busiest, the high strung areas, that is the ICU, the OTs, and the emergency rooms. These are the most um, uh, you know, busy areas of the hospital, and uh, that to, to the problem really is that majority of the care today is actually being given in the in the outpatient and ambulatory settings, which themselves can pose specific problems. Now, why is it so difficult to perceive perceive harm caused in the hospitals? Every time we have we have a plane crash. Uh, it's all over the place. With all due respect to people who have died in the, uh, you know, in the Malaysian airlines, uh, why does it make such a big news? It's because it's obvious, and you can see it happening. Whereas errors in patient safety are happening so uh, subliminally, so 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 uh, subterranean level that you you don't get to know what is happening. Now, real harm, real harm is much more impressive if if there is 
financial implications involved if there is resource utilization that happens agar if you if you end up spending more money if you end up using more resources to to overcome that problem that is where you uh, have um, uh, you know real harm is appreciated more but uh, for example as 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 the slide shows we have when there 1729 billion dollars are lost in income disability or healthcare cost you appreciate that but but how do you appreciate uh, you know experience of patient who harm uh, the, the experience of patient cannot really be evaluated how badly he felt about something or for example uh, the the fear and the and and the lack of trust and uh, and the uh, the lack of faith that comes up uh, when a patient has once already been affected by uh, the illness that cannot be uh, measured but but which really is a very important factor the other one is the uh, physical and the psychological uh, harm that has caused uh, sometimes patient has so traumatized that uh, they really can't overcome it um, finally uh, the doctor who has caused it the the loss of confidence that he suffers is um, is is really enormous so and that would affect his career for the rest of his life and uh, the the um, uh, the harm that is caused to that is enormous right now uh, this is a very important slide because it says that one in the the who has has said that one in 10 person uh, one in 10 person should receive any kind of a um, care or treatment um, suffers from preventable harm that is a reality uh, right and here is a fact file it says that uh, 1.4 million people worldwide patients worldwide suffer from healthcare associated infections and 50% of all medical equipment are either unusable or or cannot be uh, effectively used 70% of uh, sterilized or unsterilized stents uh, 70% of all syringes which are used are unsterilized reusable stents and uh, that 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 is really a, a huge number really when talk about in terms of millions of use 1.3 million uh, injections which are given every year are um, are can cause death now briefly i want to tell you about where it all started it started in 1999 uh by a, a huge a fantastic report called the uh, two errors human which was given by institute of medicine and it came out of this 3000 page report it's an it's an amazingly lucid and well written um report and available in many many languages and uh, you can download that freely from the from from the net and it's it's an it's, it's an amazing it was when it came out it was quite a bombshell dropped on the world where they realized that one of the biggest uh, issues is uh, medical error right now um, thereafter the who started what is called the who global patient safety challenge gp s uh, gp sc uh, which is uh, the first was a uh, enormously successful challenge called uh, the first was a enormously successful program called the clean care is safe care that was a very uh, useful program second was called safe safe surgery saves lives uh, the third one was the uh, was called the tackling acrim antimicrobial resistance all three of them there's a lot of stuff to be spoken about read about here i'm not going to be talking a lot about that i'm going to specifically restrict myself to one uh, one but very important and often overlooked uh, uh, point which is called the medication management now medication management uh, i hope some of you have heard it it's very relevant to to doctors to nurses to paramedical staff and so on and so forth what is medication management and i'm going to quote the uh, M NCCMERP which is a national coordinated council for medication error reporting and prevention which defines medication error as any preventable event that may cause or lead to inappropriate medication use or patient harm when the medication is in the control of the healthcare professional patient or his attendant or consumer right understand this there are certain terms which are important here 
one is preventable event right and um, something which can which can cause patient harm or an appropriate medical medication use when it is in the hands of anybody a doctor to in the hands of the healthcare worker and now the patient as well right now this can be result as a result of the of of professional use because of procedures product systems prescribing communication labeling packaging compounding administration so on and so forth so uh, this can because of any of the above reasons now broadly medication errors can be because of the following uh, reasons it could be prescribing error right that is what is prescription i'm sure you know what prescription are you, you you assess the need for and you select the particular drug you individualize the therapeutic regimen according to the patient and give the patient the drug that's called pres or writing that uh, drug is called prescribing dispensing administration monitoring and system and management control these are the various medication processes now medication error can um, really be broadly classified into prescription errors transcription errors dispensing errors administration errors and monitoring errors so you have prescription transcription you prescribe you transcribe you dispense administer and monitor any of these five stages uh, can result in a medication error uh this particular slide i want you to focus on that slide and it speaks about um are an average about the the largest percentage is caused because of prescription wrong prescription followed by wrong administration followed by transcription and finally by dispensing about 2 lakh odd uh, medication errors happen every year but not all of them are harmful less than about 1% is harmful and about 1.1% of that is um, is is cause about patient patient death so that's that about or about 2 lakh or so 36 odd cause death among uh, patient that's a pretty big number if you if you analyze again focusing on the types of uh, medication errors that we have we have um, we have prescription transcription administration at uh, uh, dispensing and monitoring you can have wrong dose wrong choice wrong drug wrong route wrong uh, known allergies missed dose wrong timing wrong frequency wrong technique commonest is wrong dose that's 28% of all uh, errors happen in terms of wrong dose you can have drug drug interaction wrong route extra dose failure to 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 act on a test you you give a test and then something goes wrong you don't act on it you give a wrong drug that's called the wrong choice or you give a wrong choice of drugs you you have a known allergy you still give the drug that's still an error you have missed a, uh, a dose that even that is an error right you don't monitor adequately uh, you that's that's an error again and uh, finally other causes so these are some of the uh, errors that have that can happen now quickly moving on to i I'm aware that some of you must have known what medication errors are, and uh, these are the principles and strategies for medication management. <clears throat> what are the strategies? One is selective strategy to improve medication safety. Is R? You must adopt all all uh, patient safety errors are primarily a system defect. the error lies not in not in the drug itself or or a particular person or uh, the the way they handle the drugs or the hospital the the error lies in the system right so one is that we have to adopt a system oriented approach to medical medication error reduction second is that we have to we have to implement standardization standardize standardization of of i'm sorry about i'm spawner spoonering we have to implement standardization of of um of dose timing of medication dose how you going to give it how you going to sca scale it how you going to customize it for every patient third is that we we have to standardize the prescription writing and prescription rules how 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 how, how are you going to prescribe the drugs how will you uh, you know ensure that it is it is being um written in the right right dosage 
we have to limit the number of different kinds of common equipment. For, for example, what, what really happens is that uh, the ICU, you have X number of uh, infusion pumps. So you have, to, you, you have to ensure that you use the same company infusion pumps that everybody is familiar with the same uh, way it works. For example, just like we used to a particular laptop, a particular way our system functions. Similarly, we have to ensure that the number of different kinds of common equipment have to be kept the lowest. Many uh, Western countries have a computer efficient or a computer efficient order entry system wherein you you have a uh, you have the, f the physician uh, kind of giving the prescription on the system. The system pops up with whatever is wrong with uh, what you prescribed. It it also um, gives prompters. So that kind of ensures that your errors are, are rectified at each level. Uh, that and uh, by the use of pharmaceutical softwares. We also have a unit dosing system and we have, uh, and more importantly really is that we need to make sure that the, um, the pharmacy is being centrally monitored. We ought to have a centralized pharmacy within the hospitals where uh, this thing is, uh, is, is implemented. Right? We have to have a special and a different protocol for uh, any of the high risk medication that we are using. So that is that is one of the most important things. Certain other things like first we have we, we should not use uh, corrosive stuff in the in the wards. We must ensure that different label stuff. I'll come to that subsequently. Um, of course, we have to ensure that we we include the patient in the uh, decision making process. Most important thing is for the patient to know uh, as to what he is getting and and uh, what are the side effects. What when he should take. So the patient is involved in his own, after all, it's his life and his health which is at stake. And a patient is most likely to remember his drugs better. That's an important, uh, interesting photograph. Uh, Lhasa, I hope you've heard of the term Lhasa drugs. It's look-alike and sound-alike drugs. Um, uh, as you can see in the, in the the drawing, you have the GABA pentin tablets and gemfibrosil tablets. Both of them look uh, very, very similar. Uh, looks like this is what your doctor prescribed and this is what you got. That's, this could happen very, very often. As I say, Lhasa um, is a, it's a huge problem because there are thousands of drugs in the market and there's a big potent... Uh, potentiality for, for confusion among these, these drugs themselves. Now, uh, what is contributing to this fact is of course uh, the illegible handwriting of doctors which is very, very famous, which is again uh, compounded by people who don't, who, who having been prescribed, uh, the pharmacy people don't know the uh, drugs appropriately, there are many newly available uh, products, the tendency for similar packaging. Also, uh, many many drugs have a similar clinical uh, usage, similar bioavailability, similar uh, action, right? And um, the, the the dosage is similar or frequency is similar. Um, and the sometimes the manufacturer himself uh, does not give uh, adequate information, and completely so. This is an example. Um, in even the advanced country like USA, there are 33,000 trademarked and more than 8,000 odd non-proprietary medication. Um, so that's the that's in that's a number. In fact, Institute of uh, Safe Medication uh, Safe Medication Practices has given an about a, about eight page listed um, items wherein you have uh, pairs of drugs which can be confused, which which look alike and sound like similar. This is just one of the pages from from uh, from that inventory, and uh, this is how it looks. So, um, it's for example, uh, Avanza is uh, mirtazapin, and Av uh, Avadita is is another drug which is uh, which is very similar in the way it sounds, but which is really rosaglitazone. Thank you for the water. All right. Um, in Brazil, um, similar sounding drugs, I'm not going to go into too much of detail, but uh, Lasix and Lozac and, and many similar sounding drugs are often a, a problem. 
take a look at this I don't know if it's there in your country many of us smaller hospitals in India we often have several similar looking ampules uh, which are administered in a similar fashion right am I running out of time no I'm not um, this is this is how it generally looks like many similar looking ampules being delivering similar kind looking drugs but completely different in action uh, this is how it looks like in many of our hospitals all the tablets are similar they're given in similar looking um, small sort of boxes and uh, the liability for getting or the, the chances of it getting confused is very very high now another problem of long doses for example this uh, they, they wrote 50 milligrams cut that and made it 25 milligrams and uh, look at the confusion that uh, it can cause very often done mistakes a huge mistake that we do here we um, cut and chop down the, um, the strips into very very small tablets uh, for convenience but you can't read the drug nor the dosage and that is often a cause for a problem look at this look at how we can have small uh, solutions to big problems now here all of them can look confusing the same drug they're all different dosage you how do you make doses stand out very simple you can make them stand out by ensuring that the 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 one that is bigger one pops out right you can you can make this five, the five milligram on one side or make a different color or ten milligram look differently have a different color as well now here are some of the specific uh, strategies for uh, taking care of loss of drug um, then we come to the last bit of my presentation now uh, what are the specific strategies you have to ensure that healthcare organizations are are actively uh, managing and actively identifying the Lhasa drugs you have to have an annual review of Lhasa medication we must implement clinical protocols which minimize the use we must have keep on having a system where you have minimal use of, of telephonic conversations you have to ensure that give a drug's name and you repeat it back to you so that is called a repeat back phenomenon we also have to ensure that verbal orders are minimized everything written down you have to ensure that every time you give the medication prescribe the medication and you you um, you have to read the label again before you administer the drug rather than simply relying on on kind of seeing where it is kept or reading it from far very important and uh, also people who for example the nurse who is injecting the medication should also have a fair amount of knowledge of the condition should really know whether the uh, the the condition actually warrants this medication or not right so that is another very important uh, factor which uh, which 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 is often played out we must also include both propriety and non propriety name in the in the list in the in in, in the prescription itself and should try and put the non property name much bigger so that we, we kind of focus more on the non property name as well we must bring in strategies to bring down the confusions and, and contradictions in terms of the, the drugs for example something called tall man littering for example if you have dopamine dopamine both of them have common the word D but the word P and B are different so you can write you can write D small a large P dopamine right and if you want a dobutamine you write D small o capital B that's called a tall man so that way you know that this is dopamine and that is dobutamine so uh, that is one um, one way to to um, to ensure that you, you you have identified the right drug storing now we have to ensure that those drugs that look and sound like are stored in different areas of the store right there is either they can be um, in non-alphabetical order by bin size or organ organ specific or disease specific and so on and so forth and we give them the automated uh, devices 
you can use there are innumerable techniques in the in the market on the net you can use color coded uh, differentiation bold phase uh, many things have been done you can have separate shelves and so on and so forth now uh, like i said before you know it's it's much more important for this important but what is also equally important and not more important is to involve the patients and their caregivers in reducing the risk that's how we must do it because you have to give the caregivers and the patient written information written name of the drug and the information when do you take the medication how should you take the medication how often what is the drug what are the side effects and so on and so forth you must for example in india there are like about 700 languages so 30 official languages so we must develop strategies to incorporate patients with sight impairment language problems uh, limited knowledge education is i'm sure as your countries as well uh, education is a problem so we must know that patients often don't know much about the medicines right uh, we must ensure also that the that the um, the, the patient um, has the, the 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 patient review catch is given to uh, the pharmacist as well, so that the, the the pharmacist kind of can correlate between the patient's condition um, and the uh, the drug itself, right? So uh, that these are some of the simpler techniques to to it. Now, what, where 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 do these problems? Why, despite so many techniques we known, despite having known that. Um, this is extremely useful why do we have problem we have problem because there is a huge market out there which make tons of money by selling proprietary drugs we know that we are all aware of this fact um, there is also a, a personal preference among doctors certain doctors think certain drugs are more effective they know why they they will continue to prescribe those drugs there is a need the problem is it requires a behavioral change and that will require, require a complex education campaign. We still haven't nailed it as yet as to what exactly is required. We have to ensure that a complex program is in place to inform the patients and his practitioners. And uh, of course, there is a sphere of, there's some sort of cost. For example, this uh, computerized um, patient prescription system require requires fair amount of monetary input and so for technology is often not available in poorer countries that's one of the problems mm, also there is no standardization in terms of uh, among various countries there are no uh, regulations for example america is far more uh, regularized system than what we have so there is a wide variability among among countries in terms of standardization or regularization of of, of medication and there is a language barrier which is uh, which is always there both abroad and in India and I'm sure in your countries the lack of technology the lack of uh, commitment to, to implement these uh, things and of course the there is a huge industry like a huge industry out there trying to expand the number of drugs that are out in the market there is again no standard method for what I called earlier dopamine and dopamine example of tall boy lettering right and um, there is a there has to be systematic use of, of uh, uh, non proprietary names which is not happening and again market pressure pressure is always there and there is reluctance amongst the uh, healthcare personnel themselves to, to encourage use of uh, non proprietary drugs with, with that I uh, would like to uh, complete my lecture and I'm uh, most open to any discussions that you want to have.